recent installment in the Stanford Human Rights Center's Future of Human Rights series. We're really pleased to welcome Ken Shulman here today. My name is Clara Long, uh, and I'm a fellow in the Human Rights Clinic. And uh, I just want to tell you guys a little bit about Ken before he starts talking. Hopefully, uh, it won't be anything too embarrassing. <laughs> Ken uh, is a veteran journalist with about 25 years of print and broadcast journalism experience. He's been a reporter. He started out as a soccer reporter for the AP in Europe, uh, following nine games on the radio at the same time and writing stories about them at the end of the game. Uh, he's been producing, uh, he's researched, produced, and voiced stories in 40 countries uh, and can work in seven languages, uh, which uh, is, is a lot. You, and it, people can get points, I guess, for, for guessing the languages. Um, his work has appeared in the New York Times, Newsweek, uh, the International Herald Tribune, which I guess now is the International New York Times since last week, uh, the Times of London, Vanity Fair, and NPR. He's been uh, a correspondent for 16 years for the national public radio show Only a Game. Who here has listened to Only a Game? Yeah, awesome. Uh, and recently has founded uh, a television and web-based series called Away Games, which uses sports as a lens to view uh, lives, conflicts, and culture across the globe. Um, he uses sports stories to tell more complex stories, including human rights stories, and I think that's something of what he's going to tell us about today. Um, Ken uh, is a graduate of the Harvard Kennedy School and Middlebury College, and he has won the Edward R. Murrow Award for Excellence in Broadcasting twice, the Friedman Martin Media Fellowship at the Kennedy School of Government, um, and the Champion of Justice Award from the National Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys. So uh, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Ken Shulman. Oh, thank you very much, and thank all of you for coming. I hope you'll enjoy your lunch, and I hope you'll enjoy the presentation. Um, I'm Ken Shulman. I'm a veteran journalist, and I've written stories about, I think, every topic that's possible to write about. In my 30 years of work, I've discovered that I've made more connections through my interest in sport than I have through all my other interests combined. I love opera. There are about six other people in the world I can talk to. I'm really interested in, in um, quantum physics. There are about three people I can talk to. I love soccer. I can talk to the entire world. And that's what this presentation is about. It's about the power of sport and perhaps how sport can be used both as an iconic tool in human rights and as a practical tool in human rights. All right, so that's my name, Away Games, and I'd love to answer questions about Away Games when the performance is over. Performance, the presentation. <laughs> so who's this guy? Okay, what do you do? How about this guy? Kind of looks like John Goodman? Yeah. Branch Rickey. Now, who was Branch Rickey? Branch Rickey was the son of a Methodist minister. He was, for a short time, a professional baseball catcher. His career ended, one, because he didn't hit very well, but mostly because he refused to play on Sundays. He later on went on to be the general manager of the St. Louis Cardinals and um, put together a great team called the Gas House Gang. He later went to the Brooklyn Dodgers, and he and his colleagues at a certain time decided it was time to integrate Major League Baseball. <clears throat> There we go. He and his colleagues decided it was a time to integrate Major League Baseball. Before that, there, were, there was Major League Baseball, and there was something called the Negro Leagues. And there were great players in both leagues. And they often played against each other in unofficial competition. In order to integrate Major League Baseball, they needed the right man. There were better players in the Negro Leagues than Jackie Robinson. Robinson was a good player, but there were better players. Robinson, however, was a veteran of the United States military. He was also college educated. He was also well spoken. They needed someone, unfortunately, that wouldn't appear to be a hot headed African American. And there's a very famous exchange where when Ricky is talking with Robinson and he says, You can play for the Dodgers, but you got to promise me one thing. The first year you play, 
you can't fight back. They're going to spit on you. They're going to slide into you. They're going to they're going to beat you up. You can't fight back. And Robinson allegedly said, "You looking for a Negro who's who's afraid to fight back?" And Richie Ricky allegedly said, "No, I'm looking for a man who has the guts not to fight back." So. Uh, Anybody can, anyone identify the man playing the piano and you get extra points, although it's totally irrelevant if you can identify the violinist, but the man playing the piano. The man playing the violin is Jack Benny, who was a very famous comedian in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Here's the pianist again. This man started his career as a haberdasher, a hat salesman in uh, Missouri, but he's not known for his hats. He is Harry Truman, 33rd president of the United States. Um, Truman did many things. Truman was the man who decided to drop the atomic bomb on Japan at the end of World War II. Um, he had a, another very significant decision. Now, Jackie Robinson made his debut in Brooklyn in 1947. 1948, President Truman wipes out segregation in the armed forces. This is Executive Order 9981. Now, can anybody name the first African-American cadet at West Point. How about the first Muslim American fighter pilot? How about the first female cadet at Annapolis? What about the first Muslim heavyweight champion of the world? Okay. I think it's really significant that something as important as the integration of the armed forces of the United States has less resonance in our popular memory, mine included, than the integration of Major League Baseball. Everybody knew who Jackie Robinson was. Most people knew who Branch Rickey was. Um, Muhammad Ali came up. By the way, does anyone know who the first um, African-American member of Congress was? Believe it or not, I researched this. I've forgotten his name, but it was a man named Hyde. And he was from Mississippi, and he was elected to the US Senate in 1870. And that's just an aside. My point is, Sport, because of its broadcast, because of its reach, has a place in the popular consciousness that no other human activity has. Just to throw some figures at you. Okay, it's a billion people who play cricket. Forget who watch it, who play it. We don't even know how many people play soccer. Um, here is a look at some of the spectator totals for major sporting events. Now for the Beijing Olympics, that's um, total viewers. For South African FIFA World Cup, that's total viewers. For the 2011 World Cup uh, cricket semifinal, this is in Mohali in India, one billion people. That's a single match. An estimated one billion people watched this. In contrast, just a little over 65 million, a paltry sum, watched the second US presidential debate last year. I don't want to make a commentary what's more important, but I will tell you which has the greatest resonance. <laughs> um, as I said before, in my experience, um, I've been able to bridge more gaps, class gaps, language gaps, culture gaps, political gaps, time zones, um, through sport than through any other interest, any other activity. Now, a lot of people have understood the symbolic import of sport and are using it, sometimes to very good use, like the No Racism campaign in soccer. Some of these communications are very moving and touching. You know, here we have a very happy, smiling, obviously Muslim young girl who's just, her li whose life has changed because she gets to participate in sport. Here's sport that's being used as a bridge between war and communities. This is a summer camp that started off in Maine and now has campuses, I believe, in Morocco and in France and in Singapore. And they bring together, they take kids out of places like Israel, Palestine, like Bosnia, and have them, have them play games together and have them discuss after they've played games together. Some of the uh, iconic images are um, kind of poignant. This, you probably know about the amputee soccer players in Sierra Leone. If you don't, you'll know more about them in a minute. This is a uh, former standout in the South African uh, Colored League. There were three, under apartheid, there were three professional uh, soccer leagues. There was white, there was colored, and then there was a mix for people they couldn't decide 
were white or, or colored. And this is Jim Sobey and with a portrait of his championship 1947 Orlando Pirates team in Soweto. Some of the things that people do with sport are very pointed. Now this is from Sao Paulo in Brazil last year. You know Brazil is hosting the World Cup and is soon to host the Olympics. And it's been quite a surprise that this, perhaps the most soccer mad country in the entire planet, um, is questioning whether it's worthwhile economically, socially, for any number of reasons to host a huge and very expensive sporting uh, competition when there are so many social problems to be uh, resolved. And I'd like to talk about that as well a little bit later. This is a, um, a joint peace initiative between India and Pakistan. Um, the shot comes from, we, we shot our away games demo in Delhi this January at the, um, during an India-Pakistan cricket match. And this is a cross-border peace initiative called the Man Kiasha. It's um, a phrase that translates into the hope for peace. Some of the power, some of the ways that sport is being used now and has always been used is pure propaganda. I don't know if you're old enough to remember the so-called Miracle on Ice. Miracle on Ice is the 1980s uh, Olympic Games at Lake Placid. And in a completely unexpected upset, the United States hockey team, which was the equivalent of a good amateur team, beat the Soviet Union, which was the equivalent of the best team on earth. And uh, in, in the locker room, the uh, coach Herb Brooks um, to a rather interesting conclusion. The fact that Michael Ruzioni scored the fourth goal with about uh, 11 minutes left to play meant that capitalism was better than communi was communism. And if, so if you didn't know that before, fortunately we won the game and that's how you knew that. Um, Cuba, Cuba, and we're gonna get, get into this a little bit later too. Cuba places enormous emphasis on sport both for its domestic population as a way to engender patriotism and health, and particularly as a way to broadcast the success of the revolution in the country abroad. Um, Angel Iglesias is talking about uh, what can Cuba do? What can Cuba do with this huge, with this behemoth of a country 90 miles away that is really putting the screws into it economically? Because all we can do is beat them in volleyball and baseball and judo. The only victory open to them at this point is a symbolic victory of sport. I don't know how many of you followed the World Athletic Championships in Moscow this summer. There was kind of a, um, a firestorm brewing because of the anti-gay laws in Russia. If you don't know, one of the standing laws on the Russian books is that it is illegal to proselytize for a gay lifestyle in Russia to people under 18. So it's not illegal to be gay, you just can't be proud about it, particularly with kids. And uh, one of Russia's most famous athletes, a pole vaulter named Yelena Izinvayeva, gave an interview to the Western press in which she said, and I'm not quoting, but I'm paraphrasing, we don't have this problem in Russia. In Russia, we're normal. It's just boy and women and women and boys, and we don't want to have this problem. We like it the way it is. Of course, that made headlines in all the Western press, um, who's ready to jump on anything that seems less civilized than, than the West is. Uh, the following day, two Swedish athletes in protest uh, painted their fingers in the various colors of the rainbow. And then the following day, this photo appeared. These are um, the two of the members of the 4x400 four relay team, which won the gold medal in the, in the athletic competition. And these two are kissing at, at the finish line. And in the Western press, this was billed as another protest. These are Russian athletes, two women that are obviously kissing um, to defy or to upstage Vladimir Putin's anti-gay legislation. The problem was that's not what they're doing. They were just kissing each other because they won the race. And um, the Western media made every major paper, from the Independent to the New York Times to ESPN, use this photo as a way of furthering its agenda, saying, look, there are even Russian athletes <coughs> who are against this legislation. When the fact of the matter is this was pure propaganda and it wasn't even what happened. Now, some of the power of sport is really used to, um, to a negative end. And it's become particularly um, European soccer has become a focal point to, um, I don't want to call it a legitimate expression of racism, but an unbridled expression of racism. If you attend a soccer or football match in Spain, in Greece, in Italy, in Russia, and there is a player of color on the other team, when that player of color gets the ball, people start out with Zulu chants. Like, zoo, 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 zoo. And it's absurd. It's something in the United States we fought battles for 30, 40 years ago, and these things don't happen. Um, you see some interesting propaganda in the stands, too. And uh, 
some interesting gestures from players. Nostalgic for better times, I imagine. And just so you don't think that it's only the fascists who uh, use football, we have the other side too, and there's red propaganda as well. We had a hammer and sickle and, and Che as well. So both sides use their fan base as a way to, to express almost forbidden sentiments, to express resent, um, repressed sentiments. It may be interesting for you to know that in the so-called Arab Spring, the first group of people to occupy Tahrir Square were the fans of a working class soccer club called al Khali. The first people to confront them and to battle with the rebels were the fans of an upper-class soccer club called Zamalek. So the Tahrir, I don't want to say that they started the Arab Spring, but the first people to take action in Tahrir Square were two rival groups of ultras, were soccer fans. All right, the greatest stage on earth. I think it's clear why I call it the greatest stage on earth because of the numbers I showed you. It, just in terms of eyes alone, there's nothing else that can touch sport for grabbing numbers of people. Um, also, the quality of the people that you're getting in terms of the diversity is unparalleled compared to any other activity. So what can sport do towards the quest for social justice, towards human rights, and towards political solutions rather than military solutions? I've got three categories because I'm doing a PowerPoint presentation, and that means that there are only three categories in any subject. So I call them millions of eyes, and these are all going to have three subcategories soon. Um, I'm going to call them millions of eyes, antidote for war, and redemption, and reparation. Millions of eyes, as I promised, there are three subcategories. Um, as an advocate in human rights, you can take advantage of sport's unparalleled popularity. It will enable you, by somehow incorporating sport into your approach, to reach a broader audience. And to really connect with the people with whom you need to connect, not with the people with whom you agree, because you're already connected with them. Connect across cultures and classes. Um, there's a saying in Brazil, there's only one place where all of Brazil meets, and it's at the stadium. The Brazil, you may know, has huge, huge disparity between income and, and educational level. But the, the people come together at the stadium. And use a sport lexicon to spread your message, whether you're referring to an athlete, whether you, you're just incorporating language, like we're going to go for the goal line, we're going to try for a three-pointer, we have a Hail Mary. Sometimes you can connect better with people because they'll recognize, oh, this is a regular guy. This isn't a pretentious and uh, highly educated human rights advocate. This is a regular guy who likes the game. Oh, I only have two here. This is really tragic. Antidote for war. Um, this is very important. Sport can be used to shift hostilities from the battleground to the playground or the playing field. And in a, in a much more in a clinical level, if you, could, you can involve figures from sport in peace negotiations and in disarmament movements. Sometimes, and particularly in distressed countries where there is no trust, where the people have been betrayed by various governing factions and by various corporations or by various outside and inter intervening powers, the only people they trust are their sports heroes. And if you can get your sport hero involved, um, you may be able to make progress in an area where you, where you otherwise might have seemed impossible. Redemption and reparation. I, I forget the most important thing about sport. Sport is fun to play. I mean, if, if there's nothing else, that's why we do it. All the rest of it, the t-shirts and the Nike and the just do it, that's ancillary. That's something they build up. Sport is something that we enjoy. It's a natural impulse. It makes us feel healthy. It makes us feel alive. One of the things we can do for the victims of war, um, of poverty, of natural disaster, is to give them a sense of normal life. And part of normal life just means you're participating in sport. You're not going to make it to the World Cup. You're not going to make it to the Olympics. You're just having fun kicking a ball around or throwing a ball or running against each other. The reintegration of child soldiers. You probably know as much, if not more, than I do about the problem of child soldiering. Um, these are kids that could be 10, 11, 12 years old who have been brainwashed, drugged, beaten, abused, and somehow enticed to do horrible things with which they're going to have to live for the rest of their lives. Under the same heading of return to normalcy, we return to our, the happiest parts of our childhood, or many of us do, when we go back to the games we played in our childhood. And if we can, as part of the reintegration program, 
uh, both victims of abuses and perpetrators of abuses get them back to a place that has connotations of happiness and innocence and health. We do well. Uh, last and lastly, um, there's an iconic value to certain buildings and um, certain facilities. And I remember visiting a facility in Nablus on the West Bank that had been at first a Jordanian military outpost and later became a prison that the Israelis used to, um, to house what they considered the more militant uh, Fatah people. When it was turned back to the Palestinian Authority, the Palestinian Authority transformed it into a gymnasium and a sports facility. And it still has a museum-like quality. There are cells. And if you look on the walls, you can see places where the people who were in, I forget the word they called it, but the solitary confinement box used to scratch words into the plaster just to sort of stay sane. But this is now a place that connotes health, where children go, and you can hear laughter. So these are all, I think, very effective strategies. I'm going to give you some examples of how these have been implemented. Millions of eyes. Anybody know what this is? This is one of the most iconic images from 1968. I will tell you. Here's a hint. And for those of you not alive, I can assure you 1968 was even better than they describe it. It was the most exciting year that it, of, my, of my life, and I was only 11. So the guy on the left is a man named Tommy Smith. He's an American sprinter. And in the photo of uh, the three runners, the man to Tommy Smith's right is called John Carlos. And John Carlos later went on to play football for the, for the uh, Philadelphia Eagles. But that's not what he's known for. So these guys won in Mexico City the 200-meter dash. And um, Smith won the gold, and John Carlos won the bronze. And an Australian runner won the silver medal. So after the win and before the medal ceremony, Smith and Carlos decided that they were going to make a protest. And this falls under the category of millions of eyes. Remembering they're making this under, they're making this before a United States television audience. I don't know the numbers, but it's one of the biggest television audience of the time. And worldwide, it's being worldwide. This was a time of terrific racial unrest in the United States. There were riots across the country. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Smith and Carlos decided that they would make what is called a black power protest on the metal stand. And they're both going to wear black gloves to symbolize black power. Trouble is that um, John Carlos forgot his gloves. And if you notice in the photo, Tommy Smith in the first position has his right hand raised, and John Carlos in the lower position has his left hand raised because they had to split the pair of gloves. <laughs> but <laughs> it didn't work. It, it's, it worked out OK. It still works. I think it's supposed to be the right. I think it's supposed to be the right. Interestingly enough, the Australian runner on the silver uh, part of the podium, whose name I, I apologize, I've forgotten, um, also participated in this. And he wore a pin um, advocating for the rights of indigenous peoples in Australia. And he was banned. He was kicked off the team for two, three years in Australia for doing that. Anyway, this is one of the most iconic images, in all, iconic political protest image in all of sport. Um, this is a story that's very close to my heart. This is Prague, uh, 1968. It's the Soviet invasion. There was something called a Prague Spring. The leaders of Czechoslovakia, which is part of the Warsaw Pact, um, that's the umbrella organization under the Soviet Union, the leaders of Czechoslovakia wanted to um, loosen up on some of the restrictions of their communist country. They wanted to have something called socialism with a human face, and it was quite enlightened, and it was a great threat to the empire. And the Soviets invaded in the spring of 1968. So um, it's 19, 1969. It's March or February. And I'm living in my suburban home in Boston. And that was the end of my universe. And all I cared about was hockey and the Boston Bruins. And I was a Sunday afternoon. I had nothing to do. And I turned on the television. And there's a game being broadcast in black and white. And it was kind of a funny, funny uh, rink. It didn't look like any NHL rink I had seen. And the teams I didn't recognize, one of the teams had a jersey with what looked to be a, um, a lion crest on it. And the other team had these four really strange letters on it. And um, I couldn't make any sense of the letters. But it was a pretty good game. And I started to watch. And it um, turned out it was coming from the World Hockey Championships of 1969, at, um, which were held in Stockholm. 
and it's two to two, and then the team with the lion crest made it four to two, and the team with the letters made it four to three. And my mother sat down next to me, and she wasn't a big hockey fan. And um, we're watching the game. And at the end of the game, um, it's four to three with the team with the with the crest. And my mother's crying. I can't figure out why. And uh, and she says to me, um, she explained to me that there was this big country called the Soviet Union, and there was this small country called uh, Czechoslovakia, and that the Soviet Union had invaded. Czechoslovakia the previous spring, and she kept saying to me, you don't know what this means to these men. You don't know what this means to these men. And if you see below, um, because Czechoslovakia beat the Soviet Union, it was a moment of great joy and exaltation. Like Angel Iglesias said, the, the, um, the official from India, the Cuban Sports Authority, what else can we do? We can't beat the Soviet Union in a war, but we can beat them in hockey. And hockey became a method of protest for this occupied country just to express its own sense of being. Czech is not one of the languages that I speak. All right, Cuba. Cuban sport before the revolution was pretty much the exclusive province of the rich. Uh, if you were wealthy, you could play sport. There were a lot of great baseball players, uh, a lot of great boxers, and they pretty much got sucked up into the United States, which had a professional system that could that could um, support them and pay them much more than the human system could. When Castro took over, as part of the Constitution, there is a law that says that all Cubans will have, every Cuban will have access to sport. And that seem, may seem like a kind of superfluous uh, thing in a country that's, just, that's still fighting a war, that's just um, staged a revolution. And that has a very powerful neighbor, which is probably going to invade it relatively soon. I mean, you think you'd be thinking about arms, you think you'd be thinking about martial law. But it was very important to Castro that all Cubans have access to sport. And they did, and they still do. I will say that Cuban sport has suffered greatly since the fall of the Soviet Empire because they, the country used to benefit from about $4 billion a year in subsidies. And um, the, economic system, the economics of Cuba right now are quite dire, uh, particularly because of the American embargo. Um, some of these photos, this is, a, this is a youth sport facility where they're playing ping pong. The one, this one here to the top right, that's the Pioneers. And the one to the lower right is actually one of their major league baseball practice fields. And if you've ever seen a major league uh, practice field in the United States, you know it's eons ahead technologically. And, and then to the bottom, this kid's playing stickball. Um, one of the funny things about walking around Cuba is Unlike most other countries where kids are always kicking a soccer ball, the Cuba kids are playing baseball. It's one of my favorites. This should be a watchword, like, take care of your health, practice sports. But this is a watchword. This is a slogan. This is something that the government is projecting to the people, that sport is a good thing. Um, you probably recognize the guy with the cigar. Anybody know who the guy with the boxing gloves is? This is Teofilo Stevenson. Teofilo Stevenson is a three-time... Uh, gold medalist in heavyweight Olympic boxing. And as you see, uh, he's probably the second most famous man in Cuba after Fidel. Cuba has done remarkably well by any measure in international competition. Not in winter competition, but in summer competition. Whether it's per capita, whether it's um, by GDP, whether it's by land mass, um, the United States would have had to have won thousands of medals proportionally to compare with what Cuba has done. Um, why is this a priority? This is a way for the government to project the glory of its revolution, to project the glory of the Cuban people on the world stage. It's done incredibly effectively. They concentrate on a few sports. It's mostly track and field, judo, and, uh, and boxing, and volleyball. And they're great at it. And it works two ways. It projects. It projects an image of a successful Cuba abroad, but Cuban sport victories also console ordinary Cubans for the significant daily hardships that they endure. You know, we can't get fresh bread. I've got to stand in line for six hours to get my rations, but Ana Fidelia won the gold medal. And I'm, I may be sounding facetious about this, but for a country in duress, these things morally are extremely important. Antidote for war. Remember that the original Olympics were founded as a surrogate for war between the, the warring Greek states. The idea was you're going to transfer their hostilities from the battlefield 
to the playing field. <sighs> Liberia. Now, Liberia was under a prolonged civil war, which had two phases for the better part of two decades. The country was a mess. The country was in shambles. And um, this man, Ezekiel Pajibon, I, I did an NPR piece about Liberia maybe about eight years ago. And he was talking about what it meant to have this man here in the opal shirt, George Weah, be named the World Soccer Player of the Year in 1996. And it goes back to what I'm saying before. The country is destroyed. People are shooting each other. Children are being abducted, drugged, beaten, and coerced into being soldiers. What do you look for for hope? Where is the beacon that's going to make you get up in the morning? This was it. This was the one thing that they could be proud of in the world. Now, is that a sad commentary? Yes, but that's what happened. George Weah. And I met Weah a couple of times. He played at AC Milan when I was living in Italy. So when the truce was established, there were still dozens of armed factions in the countryside and in the outskirts of Monrovia. Young kids with guns. Uh, young kids who had seen and done horrible things, who didn't trust anyone. That's a very dangerous situation. The peace will not hold. Weya volunteered to, uh, to join UNICEF, and he got himself named an ambassador, and headed up the DDR, Disarmament, Demobilization, and Rehabilitation Effort, for UNICEF. He was the one person that all the factions trusted. Again, no commentary on that. Um, I want to give a lot of credit to Weya. Weya was a wealthy man. He owned a villa in France. He owned a villa in Italy. He didn't need to do this. He didn't need to come back to his home. He felt an obligation. He felt he owed this to his country. Partially, and I would say mainly through Weya's intervention, the factions surrendered their arms. And the peace held. And in 2005, they had elections. Now, Weya was so pleased with his result as an ambassador that he decided, I think mostly out of the goodness of his heart, that he would also um, throw his hat in the ring. There were 24 candidates. <clears throat> Weah started, started a new party called the, um, the Congress for Democratic Change. And unfortunately, his party was infiltrated by a lot of flunkies and stooges from the old regime. And he, not through, not through ill will, but through ex inexperience, got sucked into a lot of um, alliances that he shouldn't have. Now, of course, the former combatants supported him. He was their man. And here's a group of people on, um, that are squatting on a rubber plantation outside of Monrovia. And they're pointing to a Wea poster. That's who they're going to vote for. Elections were held, and Wea won the first round. Remember, this is a person who um, dropped out of school after ninth grade. And he's the top vote getter in a country that really needs leadership and needs expert leadership and needs someone who's going to know how to negotiate with the foreign partners. Round two, fortunately, a woman named Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who was a Harvard-trained economist and a former World Bank official, triumphed and became president. I don't want to speak ill of Weah. He did this um, only out of goodwill. He did this at enormous personal sacrifice. But it would have been a disaster had a person with no understanding of politics, no understanding of leadership, who couldn't even do rudimentary math to, leading, to lead a country in this condition. All right, now, apart from Stanford, Cal Berkeley, the, um, what I call the greatest rival in all of sport. Can you guess what this is? This, this is India-Pakistan cricket. Um, by numbers alone, this is the most interesting rivalry. You've got one point, well, let's see what we got. Got 1.2, 1.3 billion people in India. Add another two, 250 in Pakistan. It's a quarter of the world's population, all of whom, every single one of them, is nuts about cricket. And it's kind of interesting. There's not one single person in that region who's not nuts about cricket. Um, <laughs> I did. Well, I took a poll. Um, it's, it's kind of ironic. Um, cricket was brought to India in the mid-18th century by the British. And it was exclusively a British game. The Indians were not allowed to play. At a certain point, the Parsis, 
which is a Zoroastrian group that originally migrated up from Persia. The Parsi started playing, then a Hindu team played, then a Muslim team played. And being able to play cricket as an Indian meant that you were just as good as your colonial occupiers. You were just as good as the British. It was a symbolic victory. Um, 1947, by the way, same year that Jackie Robinson made his debut in Major League Baseball, 1947, the British withdraw. And through a tragic series of, I would call, errors, the country was partitioned into a very large, um, multi-ethnic but Hindu-majority state called India and a divided Muslim-majority, or almost exclusively Muslim, state called Pakistan. And originally, Pakistan had two parts. It had West Pakistan and it had East Pakistan. East Pakistan later became, um, after Civil War, Bangladesh. This is known as the Partition of India. It is one of the great tragedies of 20th century history. You had migrations, Muslims moving to, from India, from communities where they had lived for hundreds and hundreds of years peacefully with, with Hindus, moving to Pakistan. Hindus and Sikhs moving from Pakistan in areas where they had lived alongside Muslims for hundreds of years uh, to India. It is estimated that between 30 and 40 million people migrated. Nobody knows how many deaths there were, but they're in the millions. They're still fighting this today. This is what they're fighting over, is the division of India and Pakistan. Keep in mind that later on, these both became nuclear powers. They fought four major wars. These are, by the way, these are photos of the migrations following, following partition. This is a, um, a refugee camp outside of Delhi. This image, unfortunately, speaks for itself, as does the next one. And these were very common. People who had known each other, neighbors, friends, slaughtered each other for no reason. So here's some numbers. Now, cricket with India and Pakistan is sort of a barometer, and you can pretty much tell what's going on between the two countries if they're playing cricket. So during the years of partition, there was no cricket. During the War of 1965, they didn't play, they didn't play each other. They didn't play from 1960 to 1978 because there had been the wars. They didn't play in 18, um, 1989 when the Kargil War started. If they're playing, it means they're making nice or trying to make nice. If they're not playing, it means that they're mad. Things were looking really good at the end of the 90s and the beginning of the, the new millennium until 2007, I'm sorry, 2008, when uh, a series of terror attacks took place in Mumbai that were linked to the Pakistani secret services. Lots of things were, were cut off, bilateral negotiations, commercial ties, borders were pretty much sealed. But the one that really hurt was that they suspended bilateral cricket. And this past January, they resumed play. Um, we filmed our demo. We filmed our series pilot this past January in Delhi, and I'd like to show you a piece of it. I do hope this works. <clears throat> Mina Bazaar, with its goats on the stairs, its rugs and prayer shawls, <clears throat> and Islamic calligraphy. But there's a tension not too far beneath the surface a tension between Hindus and Muslims in India that sometimes erupts. In 1992, a mob of Hindu fundamentalists demolished the Babri Mosque in Ayodhya. Hindus and Muslims clashed all over India. Thousands died. Samir Khan writes about Hindu-Muslim friction in stage plays and essays, but he also lived that friction. In the early 1990s, when he was still a boy, he went to watch an India-Pakistan cricket match on television with Hindu friends. When India won, the group went outside to celebrate. At that point of time, there was this huge divide in India. So there was a lot of hardline uh, Hindus which uh, were out there on the streets. And after the match was over, when India won, and we were celebrating, we were confronted with this huge mob. And most of them had their faces painted, and it was a victory celebration. Suddenly, some guys hit me on my back. And I fell down. And then they started to say, Pakistan Mordaba. Pakistan Mordaba means death to Pakistan. The mob had mistaken him for a Pakistani. 
But then suddenly my friend who was a little older to me, he realized that what was happening and he, he started to fight with them and then told me to run. And that is the time I realized that they had hit me because I was a Muslim. Hardline Hindus still question the loyalty of India's Muslims. One fundamentalist leader wanted Muslims to weep in public each time India lost to Pakistan in cricket. Fear of Pakistan quickly translates into fear of Muslims, especially after Mumbai. When these attacks took place in 2008, things changed. In the public opinion, there was so much anger in India. That is how things went very bad. This tour is helping and things are looking much better. I don't see a lot of animosity on the streets, but yet you never know. There might be some incident in future and everything might be just uh, zero. Game day, Delhi, at long last. You don't need to know what overs and innings are to enjoy the greatest rivalry in all of sport. A billion and a half people, two feuding countries, all brought into focus by the only game that matters. What's so beautiful about cricket? Anything happens in this game. Each and every single ball is very important. Even for the batsman, even for the bowler. This is the first time. His first match. He wake up at around 5 o'clock in the morning and he was like, Dad, wake up, wake up, we have to go for the match. I <laughs> said, he cooled down. Why will we going? We'll be going. It's a passion. It flows in our blood in this country. It's, we love cricket. That's it. We have no more words to say it. My name is Abdul Jaya My name is Abdul My famous name is Chacha Cricket. Chacha means Uncle Cricket. Chacha is Pakistan's super fan. He almost went broke following the national team around the world. Now the Pakistan government pays for his travel. Aman Kiasha, the hope for peace. Aman Kiasha is a cross-border peace movement. Indians and Pakistanis who want their countries to get along, but they still want their cricket teams to win. Every Indian wants India win. Every Pakistani wants a Pakistan win. We want Pakistan win. India and Pakistan first faced off in cricket in 1952, five years after partition, long before these fans were born, or their parents were born. Is it very important still to young Indians and young Pakistanis to even know what happened in partition? I think uh, we have to get over it. Faisal Lakhani is a sports writer from Karachi. But in this part of the world, even a sports writer ends up talking politics and history. Whatever happened, it happened 55 years ago. It's a new generation. We have to work together with each other. We have to build bridges instead of talking about gaps and bitter memories. Is today a cricket match or is it diplomacy? It's a cricket match. It's a cricket match. It's nothing more than a cricket match. I apologize. There were some subtitles there, and for some reason, this format didn't support that. So. Redemption and reparation. Uh, Badawi camp. It's a Palestinian camp in the north of Lebanon, about five kilometers inland from, uh, from Tripoli. Um, it was one of the more crowded camps in any of the Palestinian diaspora, and then there was a war between two factions, and another camp was emptied, so the population doubled. So already an insufferable level of density was doubled. Um, a group called Right to Play, which was founded by... Um, Johan Olaf Koss, a three-time gold medal speed skater from Norway. This group uh, works to train coaches and leaders in distressed areas to create recreational and sporting programs for children in the area, and they're active in, in Lebanon. It's just an idea of what the camp looks like. This is an idea of their political ambitions. This um, right to play people, this is at a UN school. They um, 
they developed a game called the Circle Game. And you have a bunch of kids uh, running around, and they have to get in. When you blow the whistle, they have to get into the hoops. And each time you um, go to the second round, you remove a hoop, and the space gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's a game that's designed to teach kids to share space. And finally, they all have to crowd into one hoop. This is, they're young enough, it's boys and girls. And look, they're even having fun. <laughs> For older kids, now the girls, um, you may know this, exile societies, societies in refugee camps tend to be far more conservative than the societies from which they sprang. So immigrant, Italians in America remain in the Italy that they left. So Italy, while Italy has progressed, the Italians here, Politically, they're like they're Italians of the 1940s. It's the same thing with any exile group. So this exile group is particularly um, conservative. The girls wanted to play sports. The elders of the village did not want them to play sport. So what did Right to Play do? They um, they get local people. This is Mona Sayed. She's a devout Muslim. She's made the Hajj. She never goes out uncovered, but she loves sport. She went door to door for Right to Play. Um, explaining a couple of things. First of all, that this wasn't a political social state and that the elders shouldn't be threatened, that this was a right and the girls liked to play and that she would be there and the girls would be supervised and men wouldn't be peeking over the barriers or, in, or, or, or through the windows. But more than that, she went right to the Quran and she pulled out incidents where women were fighting alongside the prophet, where women were riding horses. And she said, if they can ride horses, if we can fight in the war, how is it we can't play football? How is it we can't play basketball? And it was a partial victory. All the girls were allowed to play soccer until they were 12. But once you're past 12, they were only allowed to play basketball. But it was a victory. At least it was a victory from a right to play standpoint. And here's the proof. They're actually having fun and they're smiling. This I thought was really cute. Um, this is a girls team and the only males allowed in to watch were, were uh, prepubescent boys who were watching with great interest. <laughs> um, this is an example that's how can I say this? Incredibly painful to research and unfortunately very easy to write about. This is Sierra Leone, um, which is adjacent to Liberia, and they had their own brutal civil war. And this civil war was characterized by, how can one thing be more brutal than another? A spine-chilling form of brutality in which marauding bands would go from village to village and amputate limbs. At first hands because they didn't want people to vote, then feet because what the heck, there are two of them. Um, hundreds of thousands of people lost their limbs. And if you walk around Freetown today, sometimes it looks like a typical West African town. And then you see people with missing limbs. There's just lots of them. Um, under the aegis of the UN, they set up a, a, set up a special court for Sierra Leone uh, for war crimes. One of, the one of the elements of this court was a children's art project that the children would talk about what the special court meant to them. Another response was this, the Single Leg Amputee Sport Club. This is Mambud Samai. He is a Methodist pastor from Freetown. And after the war was over, he went to what is now the Aberdeen Market in central uh, Freetown to visit the amputees. This was an amputee refugee camp. And you've got kids from all over the country who have lost limbs. And he went up to them and said, I have good news for you. You don't have to sit there and do nothing. There are countries in the world where people who are amputees play football. The kids looked at him. They thought he was making fun of them. And they started throwing rocks at him. And he had to run away from the camp. He eventually came back and he got them to try. And it is difficult to play. I mean, it's difficult to learn to walk on crutches. crutches. To play football on the beach with lousy crutches is even more difficult. And I'm going to see if this is going to work. Please bear with me one second. This is their theme song. It's in Creole, which is a mix of English and their local dialect. And this is a passage from the Gospel according to St. Mark.
It's the team manager. She was in the refugee camp as well. Um, this particular activity uh, was very helpful for these kids. A lot of them got jobs, some of them got married. Again, it's tough to live in Sierra Leone in any case. If you have the, the horror of having had your leg amputated, it's even more difficult. Um, but this has also been a great symbolic uplift for the public. People come every Saturday to watch these kids play. It means something to them when the most visible victims of a conflict, which brings great shame to this country, when the most visible victims have returned to normal life. And again, to return to what I said before, part of normal life is kids playing. A rather unlikely place to talk about reparations. This is Compton, California, it's outside of LA. It's gang territory. And these are the homies and the pops. And uh, I did an NPR story about these guys about 10 years ago. It um, started when this man named Ted Hayes was invited to play cricket. Ted Hayes is a, was a homeless advocate he was invited to play cricket uh, with some Hollywood friends, and he really liked the discipline of the game, and he thought it might be a good tool to teach discipline and respect and behavior and to engender self-respect in gang members. And he founded this team called the Homies and the Pops, and they're former gang members, and they're former homeless men. And when I did this story, uh, we drove out in a dilapidated van to an area in Compton, picked up two people, and then drove maybe... 200 meters from where we picked up those kids to the practice field in the park. And I didn't understand, but afterwards I asked, why, did, you know, why can't they just walk to the park? And he explained to me that they can't walk to the park because it's rival gang territory and they'll get killed. So that's territory that they cannot tread on. They can go through by car. These guys have uh, gotten some press. They've traveled. This is their Australian tour. They've also been to England. And this is what I find most intriguing about the Homies and Pops stories, and hopefully this is queued up in the right place. Mayflower. Ted Hayes' team takes defeat with grace. It's one of his most important lessons. Last July, with the help of a British magazine publisher, the Homies and Pops made a two-week tour through England and won four of their eight matches there. People drove from 100 miles away or more to see these inner city Yanks bowl and bat. Yet the most memorable moment, according to Compton player Gecko Escobar, was when the team went to visit Ireland. We went to Ireland as part of the peace process to illustrate that we were coming from this area. You know, Los Angeles, city of Compton, neighborhoods at war, and then we were going to Northern Ireland where they're at war with the Irish and the British, the Protestants and the Catholics. And we gave the Catholics a Protestant cricket bat and a cricket ball, and then we gave the Protestants a hurling stick. Yo, man. So these guys have a record. I just want you to listen to this record. It's really cool. It's wild these days, man. Everybody want to shoot somebody, right? Why can't we just chill? You know what I'm saying? Yo, homie, I'm just thanking God for cricket and this expedition that we're rolling with. Yo, man, I hear that. I hear that. I hear that. They serve fried chicken instead of tea at their matches. Two members of the Homies and Pops have even recorded a cricket rap demo. The team performed a live rap. Okay. Um, it's a great story. And again, no mistake, a lot of these guys turned their lives around. They got jobs, they went back to school. Something about the code of discipline that cricket imposes. Um, not losing your temper, not talking back to the umpire. Somehow help them in their daily lives. There have been some failures too. A lot of them um, went back to the gangs. One guy was shot. But for the most part, it's been an enormous, enormously successful initiative. What I find most interesting though is this connection between the warring territories of Compton and Northern Ireland. 
And what does it mean for these kids who probably never left Los Angeles to understand that there are places in the world who live exactly the way that they do and that maybe they, in their distressed situation, have something, a bit of wisdom, to impart to another part of the world. So greatest stage on earth, strategy. Some remaining, op remaining opportunities. Um, if you feel strongly about gay rights, if you feel strongly about human rights, Russia is a great target, and the Sochi Olympics are a wonderful target as well. There is discussion. A lot of people believe that countries should boycott uh, Sochi, Sochi Winter Olympics in 2014. I don't believe that's the case. I believe that you are more effective by showing up and making a declaration. I believe that absence does not speak as loudly as presence. Qatar is hosting the uh, FIFA World Cup in 2022. Apart from the madness of assigning it to Qatar, um, Qatar has just has so many injustices in its society that I won't even list it. But one of the things they're going to do is they're going to build between nine and 14 new stadiums, and they can do it. They've got plenty of money from natural gas, and it's their prerogative. They can spend it any way they want. However, um, those stadiums are going to be built by men like these. Uh, the Gulf countries, Qatar included, have a very small uh, domestic native population, an even smaller coterie of talented expatriates which handle all the, tech, the technical jobs. And then 80% of the people there are migrant workers from South Asia, for the most part, who are taken there with promises of employment and are employed. Usually the passports are confiscated. They have no rights. There are certain places where they cannot go. There are restaurants into which they're not allowed. You know, and, and again, this is a symbolic image, but here, are, here is a group of migrant uh, laborers from Sri Lanka in their part of Doha, the capital of Qatar, and across is this beautiful city that they've helped to build, but they have no access to. And then, of course, there's racism, which keeps raising its ugly head. Um, my particular favorite, I still can't believe I saw this. I was at a football match in Milan in 1991, and there's this, same, there's this huge banner. Ebrei Napolitani in Siemen del Forno. You should know that in Italy, racism, before there was a significant immigrant presence in Italy, and, and that's relatively new, racism went north to south. So the northerners considered themselves superior to the southerners, and particularly the Sicilians and the, and the people from Naples. And these people were called Terone, from Terra. They were people that were from the land. And they used to sing this beautiful song, Terone, quanto puzzi, Terone, peccanoi, how much you stink, Terone, you know, why don't you die, Meroni? So you've got this huge sign, Jews and the Neapolitans together in the oven when the Naples team comes to San Siro. And it's not so surprising that it was up. What surprised me is that no one made them take it down. It stayed up for the entire match. So there's still work to be done before we show racism, the red card. And finally, and I haven't got a strategy for this, but I think using sport is a great opportunity for what I think is the most important human rights issue, and that's social justice, fighting poverty. And that's it. Thank you very much, and I'd love to have some questions. All right. Um, obviously, we can all hear each other in this room, but if you use this mic, then uh, it will be recorded. Does anyone want, want to make a comment? or? <clears throat> Hello, thanks very much for that. Um, I just had a question about the role of international sports federations in using sport and to what extent they're, being, they're, they're engaging. It's really a checkered record uh, for every positive step that something like the International Olympic Committee and FIFA take. They do something really despicable and, and underhanded. But remember, these are not human rights organizations. They're not even governmental organizations. They're businesses, and they exist to make money. Um, yes, FIFA has launched this anti-racism campaign, but they did it, in my mind, 20 years too late. Um, and yes, the Olympics, uh, the International Olympic Committee was the first international organization to ban South Africa, but they think nothing of giving the Olympics to Beijing, whose um, human rights or offenses are equally egregious. So I think the role of international sports federation is similar to the role of um, of international or multinational corporations, which is when they're forced to change, they will do it. Otherwise, they look off by their own interests, which is what they should be doing there. That's what, that's what they exist for. I'm personally disappointed. I think they could do a lot more. Is there more to that question than? Uh, no, no that, well, I, I, my background, I've been working in, I was working with the Court of Arbitration for Sport for the last five years. Um, and I always find it quite contradictory the way 
these organizations work as you say they are businesses you know FIFA talk about the beauty of the game but it's like the beauty of the bank that's what it really comes down to and I was wondering if, if in your experience you found they have any greater interest in engaging or if it is just kind of it's nice to say no to race you know it's it's, it's a little cynical it, in my experience it's, it's their attempts to good is it's a little bit cynical and it's it's window dressing it's not that i haven't seen any more substance to it than that. I'm in full agreement with you. That said, even window dressing can be very productive because it will reach a certain amount of the population that would not otherwise be reached by that message. So even if it's semi-sincere, and it is only semi-sincere, there's a foot, former French football national named Lilian Thuram. He's a he was originally from Guadeloupe, and he's a great player. And he played he won on a, he played on the French team that won the World Cup in '98. He's got a uh, society. He's got initiative. Um, that fights racism in sport and off the field. He's leveraging his fame as a footballer to spread that message to places where it's truly needed. Um, I mean, I, I could spread a non-racist message here. I don't think it's going to have much effect. I'm guessing that most people have already embraced that message. It needs to get to the people who go to the stadium. And in that sense, it's very effective. But yes, I share your dismay. I don't, I'm not surprised at the hypocrisy or the ambivalence of the major organizations, but I find it dismaying. Um, so what, how exactly did Away Games get started and what does it do? I'm so glad you asked. Um, <clears throat> it's been my pleasure for the past 15 years to travel the earth for this show called Only a Game, which is broadcast on NPR. And through sport, I've gotten a lot more people involved in a discussion. For example, I did a story about a teenage basketball team from Ramallah who had reached the finals of the West Bank and wanted to go to Gaza for the Palestinian final and they couldn't go because there was an Israeli roadblock. There had just been a bombing and, they, and the borders were sealed. Now, I could do that story about a teacher who can't get to work. I could do that story about a truck driver who can't uh, deliver his load of whatever he's carrying. I could do that story about any number of professions and it's equally tragic. But because it was a basketball team, and because so many people either have played basketball or followed basketball, they'll listen. And once they listen, they'll listen to the intricacy of the story, and they'll follow you. And I think these are the people that, or I've always thought, these are the people that I want to reach. Because the other people who are already interested, they know the story. I got the idea that um, this could be transferred into, into television. And Radio is really cheap to produce, and television is very expensive to produce. So I found a nonprofit called The Way Games. It's a website which is up and running, and it is a television series which exists in one episode um, that we're developing for PBS World Channel. We have the broadcaster, and now when we work for PBS World Channel, there's only one rub: is that you have to find the sponsors. So I am in uh, panhandling mode and uh, presenting, making this presentation wherever I can, particularly in front of corporate boards and um, foundation boards to talk about producing this show. We have 13 episodes planned, all similar stories to what I showed you now. So what does it do? It's a media project, and it uses sport to make the world a smaller, if not more friendly, more comprehensible place. Uh, it's, it's written down there, awaygames.org. And we're always looking for interns and contributors. One of the things that we have at Away Games is if you travel and you have photos or video, that involve sport um, and we would like to share, we would like to see them, particularly if it's involving sport in a human rights, political, social justice situation. We would like to see that. Any way that we can get American audiences to consider the world at large, or to get Western audiences to consider the world at large, our vehicles through sport. Um, I just wanted to pick up on this question raised back here uh, in terms of you showed some protesters of Brazilians uh, some pictures of Brazilian protesters um, and I've heard the argument in, a, in the last couple months and I'm weighing it in my mind that I'd love to hear your thoughts on it that uh, these large sporting events like the World Cup and like the Olympics do more harm than good uh, for the communities that host them for the social justice issues that that surround those those hosting that the hosting allows a sort of development projects to be rammed down <laughs> communities throats uh, how what's your take on that again like every other good question the answer is yes and no 
Um, in terms of social justice, in terms of priorities, it's kind of hard from the outside to say that an impoverished or distressed country should build stadia as opposed to schools and hospitals and a justice system. On the other hand, take something like the South African World Cup. Um, South Africa, yes, economically, they're a little bit stronger. To, I wouldn't necessarily call it a distressed country. But that was a capability statement. That was a statement saying, this is the country. Look how beautiful it is. Five billion people are going to watch. And we want to be your gateway to Africa. And we can do it. Look what we've done. We've built stadia. We've built airports. We've built railroads. We've refurbished our, um, our highway system. And take a look. We all get along now. We're, we're, we're racially integrated. This is a place that you can do business. From that sense, it's almost an advertising dollar or a, ca or a capability statement. There is no metric, and I've seen a lot of attempts, that can truly measure the input-output of hosting the Olympics or hosting the World Cup. I will, I will quote um, a man named Tim Modise, who was an official on the South African World Cup Committee. And he said, yes, you need bread, but that's like telling a poor person that he can't read. It's like telling a poor person that he can't go to the movies. We need these things as well, and they, they give great pride to our country. On a symbolic level, I think it's a great success. On a logistic level, for a country in distress, it's mixed. For an industrialized, solid country like the United States or France or, or Great Britain, they may lose a little money on it, but it's, it's, it's almost insignificant. The other thing is, it's really good for people to see your country um, on television and to see it looking in the best possible light. I don't know if any of you saw the 2008 Beijing uh, opening ceremonies? I mean, what were they saying? What were those thousands of dancers saying other than, look out, here we are. Look what we can do. And I, you know, I certainly got the message. It was, it was if not frightening, uh, really impressive. I'm of two minds about it, but I don't think that we should be making that decision. You know, and if a country is foolish, Qatar is certainly not going to suffer economically from it. But if, if a country can't afford, can't afford it and is foolish enough to do it, that's their choice. We have uh, two minutes. Okay, Hi. so this will be a challenge. Thank you so much, Ken. It's always a pleasure to hear you talk. And um, could you elaborate a little bit more in terms of sports and social justice? You have two minutes. And um, my question is, I worry because these kids that see sports as a way out of poverty are feeding into a, a dream or a myth or an illusion because one in a million makes it? Yeah. We were talking about that at lunch today, and I'm in complete agreement. And I think that this is where sport is failing. There are so many victims of hoop dreams, of football dreams. Um, on a micro level, I think sport can do wonders um, on a participatory sense, you, particularly with young people. You get them involved, particularly in team sports. They're forced to get along with other kids with whom they might not interact otherwise. You know, it, it, you can mix classes, you can mix education, you can mix level. It's very good. It teaches discipline. It's healthy and it's fun. And let's not forget how important fun is. But on a on a majority level, yes. FIFA and the Olympic Committee have taken a stand, or at least a superficial stand, on racism. To my knowledge, no major sport organization has taken a stand on eradicating poverty or just lowering ticket prices. It costs so much to go to the game these days. It's the province of the rich. It's like pre-revolutionary Cuba. This is what I find where sport is a mirror of the great, the great injustice and the widening disparity of income gaps in our society. I think athletes could do a really good job I mean, Muhammad Ali often said, you know, be a thinker, not a stinker. Don't go to the gym. Go to school. I think individual athletes could do a very good job in promoting study, in promoting participatory sports, and I think teams could do a lot better job in talking about achieving social justice and giving children a chance, not just wealthy children, not just well children from well-educated parents, but giving all children a chance. Um, and that's as much as I'm prepared to say now. But I think that's the great challenge. 
Great. I think we're at 2 o'clock. Thank you again. Thank this you. is a real pleasure. <laughs> oh, by the way, if you want to write me, it's canettawaygames.org. Very easy to remember. <laughs> Thanks. And let me just say before you all go, uh, we've got a three events coming up for the Center for Human Rights Center. First one is November 13th, discussing Miami from Colombia. November 18th, we'll be showing Unmanned American Civil War from the Beijing Foundation. And November 19th, uh, Heather, or Jean, uh, the Hound of Kuro from the Hound of Kuro. So, once again,